Well, earlier this week, we told you that former DNC chair Tom Perez took a job at Venable LLP, a union-busting law firm and lobby shop that helps corporations skirt labor law violations. According to the Daily Poster, the same day Perez met with Maryland Democrats and progressive activists via Zoom to discuss a potential run for governor. Founder of the Daily Poster, journalist David Sirota, joins us to discuss the full story. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, what, given your capacity to be shocked uh, over, <laughs> g- g- given the, the, what, what you've reported on throughout your career, where did this one uh, rank on the shock factor? Well, it's almost like if you wrote a Hollywood script, it would be a little bit too on the nose, Mm -hmm. right? A former labor secretary going to a law firm that advertises so-called union avoidance. Uh, Union avoidance meaning trying to help employers avoid unions, avoid union organizing campaigns, and basically uh, deal with unions in a way that is most um, uh, lucrative to those employers. So if you were writing a script about that, it would be a little too on the nose. It would be a little too cartoonish. But that's exactly what happened. And the fact that it it's an Obama official uh, doing this, I think, illustrates that the revolving door in American politics is, I mean, it's obvious to us, but I think sometimes it's still worth saying, it, it, it is obviously a bipartisan revolving door. And the big question now, I think, is whether you can actually brazenly go through that revolving door at the same time, you're exploring a run for governor in a blue state. I mean, this is actually, this is something that is, if, I don't want to say it's new, but it's it's almost like a, a, a an important test case. Can you go to an anti-union law firm while simultaneously running for governor of a democratic, a traditionally democratic state? Or does going to an anti-union law firm and going through that revolving door create a problem for you? If it doesn't create a political Political problem for you in a blue state. What does that say about uh, the the foundation, really, of the Democratic Party? You know, I think anti-establishment people on the right have gotten away with this all of the time. Who also work at lobbying shops and and some of these like big firms. So I'm curious to see how it plays out on the left. To your point, David. More reporting from the Daily Poster also finds pharma giants have been getting special access to European Union officials in an effort to block patent waivers. EU commissioners with stakes in medicine vaccines, medicine and vaccines, met 140 times. David, can you break down this report for us? Because I think it's equally stunning. (laughs) Well, look, we're used to in America, the pharmaceutical industry being the most powerful political industry in Washington. Uh, There's Wall Street and there's pharma. Those are the two uh, big dogs in Washington. And I think people don't have necessarily an understanding of how powerful a pharma is across the globe. And in this story, we looked at how powerful uh, its lobbying army is, pharma's lobbying army is in Brussels when it comes to uh, EU officials. Uh, And uh, you noted the meetings, uh, the fact that there's essentially the EU is effectively captured by pharma lobbyists meeting almost exclusively with them, and and certainly not at the pace that those officials meet uh, with non government organizations pushing for patent waivers. Uh, and, and it's worth adding that pharma is spending, has been spending millions and millions of dollars on an army of lobbyists in Brussels. And what their goal is, is to effectively try to get the EU to veto uh, international uh, patent waivers for COVID vaccines at the WTO. You know, everyone celebrated uh, Biden's announcement, the vague statement of support recently uh, for those uh, for those patent waivers. But this is going to be an international process. And so it looks like uh, pharma is trying to uh, rely on using the EU as its veto of those waivers. It does not want those waivers. Angela Merkel, uh, in, in fact, after the Biden administration, uh, Catherine Tai at the uh, USTR came out and said that, you know, came out and pushed back against big, big pharma. You had you had Merkel say, well, you know what, let, let, actually, no, let, let's 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 stick with pharma on this one is kind of unusual in, to be here in the United States and to see the United States behaving better on the world stage than, than, than West, Western Europe. Do you think they're going to be successful here in their lobbying push? Well, look, the pharma's big power in Washington, really in politics all over the place, is 
is focusing in on the details. The devil is always in the details when it comes to esoteric things like patents. So my view is, is that you have a statement from Biden, from Biden's administration saying they generally support patent waivers. But having worked in Congress myself, uh, having dealt, uh, you know, been in and around, around the lobbying operation of pharma, all you really, you know that all you really have to do is change a shall to a may. You can change one word here, one word there. And a patent waiver can look like a patent waiver to allow lawmakers to release press releases saying there was a patent waiver, but there isn't actually in practice in the real world an actual patent waiver that facilitates the distribution of vaccines. So I would say that whether that happens on the American side or if it happens at the EU, we should be focusing in on it's a and it's a hard reporting job, but focusing in on those extremely granular details. A couple word changes here or there will make the difference between whether there's a real waiver or not a real waiver. Yeah, and on that point, let's just strip this down to its very basic, uh, its its most basic question, which is, what does pharma? What is pharma? getting out of the EU in terms of its own profit margin and in terms of what it wants on its own for, for its own best interests. What are they getting out of the EU from these 140 meetings? Well, I mean, that's the great that's the great question. And I think what the, what they clearly want right now is for the EU to use its power at the WTO to block any of these waivers or at minimum to limit these waivers in a way that makes them in, completely ineffective. I mean, you may have waivers that say um, there will be a patent waiver only if there's not a commercially available uh, uh, medicine on the market, uh, which of course, then the de then the question becomes, and I'm, this is a hypothetical, but then the question becomes, well, what is available, right? Those are the kinds of details that protect a pharma's patents and its profits. And that's what they wanna use the EU for at the WTO. And before we let you go, I wanted to uh, circle back real quickly to the, the Tom Perez uh, situation. And I'm curious if you've, heard this as well. You know, in Washington, uh, you know, Kelly Ayotte is, is talked about as very likely to be ta uh, you know, running for Senate again. And, and uh, has, you know, she only lost by a, a thousand votes or so last mm -hmm. time. If, if Democrats are going to hold on to the Senate, they pretty much need to hold on to that New Hampshire Senate seat. What, what I had heard is that uh, Republican leaders pushed very hard to make sure that she did not become a lobbyist in the time <laughs> leaving the Senate so that she would be better position to run in New Hampshire. And, and if you go, I don't have all of the de details in front of me. If you go Google what she's doing now, you can find her bio. And she has like six different fellowships and such that she strung together from the Republican ecosystem. I think one of them's at the McCain Institute or something, which will be fine in New Hampshire. Um, but, no, but none of them are registered lobby on behalf of, you know, X, X company, which just, it, which is an ad that, that makes itself. So that, that makes it extra interesting that Tom Perez is like, you know what? I'll do Venable, and then I'm running for Maryland governor. It is brazen. That's the word you used. Well, and, and, and look, I think what that speaks to is the presumption that inside of the Democratic Party, there are no consequences to going through the corporate revolving door, no consequences uh, when it comes really to fundamentally to corporate power. That you can ally yourself with, explicitly ally yourself with corporate power. Uh, and this will not bring any negative consequences. Now, clearly, we know it comes with positive benefits in terms of fundraising, in terms of elite connections. Uh, but the fact that there seems to be a presumption that there are no downsides. I mean, usually politicians are weighing, well, listen, if I go work for, for you know, corporations or a lobbying firm, at least I get, you know, fundraising connections, elite connections. But there may be a political downside. I feel like we're now in an era where the presumption is there is absolutely no downside. And that is a really disturbing commentary on the incentive system inside of the Democratic Party. Although I don't know if it was Bain Capital that hurt Deval Patrick, but he, or just coming in late, um, but you know, he certainly uh, paid, a, I, I do think he paid some, something of a price, at least in a Democratic presidential primary. And, and we'll, see how, we'll see how Tom Perez uh, does. He hasn't been a rousing political success since leaving the Department of Labor. I think we need another unity tour. Yeah, another unity tour. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank More you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, David. More rising for you after this.